So technology, uh, the screens that we watch, the devices we use, the content we consume have a huge effect on our lives. Um, in case you hadn't already put that together as you're watching this sermon or listening on one of your devices. But I thought maybe as we get started today, I could highlight some of those points just by some recent statistics uh, that I did some research on. Uh, this year, Deloitte did a study and they said in the United States, on average, each household has 22 connected devices in it. And that's down from 25 a year ago. Think about that, that many devices in all of our houses connected to the internet with data. In a recent Barna study, the typical 15 to 23 year old takes in 2,767 hours of screen media per year. I did the math on that, that breaks down to seven and a half hours per day. Um, and they said that church going kids and students take in 291 hours of spiritual content. So about 10% of their time on the screens while non-church going taking about 153 hours, which I found pretty interesting, about 5%. There's some interest in spirituality out there. Uh, the last one uh, felt very accurate to me. The average American spends six hours and 57 minutes a day looking at a screen. Think about that between our work and our play and our home life. It breaks down to 3.15 hours on our phones. Most people check them 58 times a day, which actually feels less than I probably look at mine. Um, it includes two hours and 27 minutes scrolling social media, one hour and 12 minutes playing games, and 53 minutes watching videos. So just in case those statistics uh, don't make the point, let me reiterate, uh, our devices, our content, our, our, our screens have a huge impact on our lives. And technology, all of it, has an impact on the ways that we live. And we need to integrate our faith well in how we use it, or else our faith will get pushed to the margins. And I uh, approach this, I hope, with great humility and also honesty. I, I love technology. I love what it can do for my life. I love that it makes me more efficient. I love that it connects me with people. I, I love that I have everything uh, at my fingertips all the time. Um, I grew up with it, which if you're under 30, you did too. For those who are on the farther end of things, this is a new way of living for folks that are farther away from that that didn't have this there. For some of you, you've just never known a time where information wasn't available all the time, every time for your life. But for me, it's been a pretty regular part of my existence throughout time. Um, I, I've usually a pretty early adopter. I try things pretty early. I have one of the earlier Twitter accounts, right? I'm not super active on a lot of the things, but I do test them out. I, I love what they can do for me. I try to use a lot of the new stuff that's out there. I, I love efficiency. I love being able to, to rapidly respond to people, but also to find things when I want to. I'm an inbox zero aficionado. I like my things tight. I like to be able to keep it clean. Um, but also I lived at a time for context when I started college, email was still a fairly new thing. And even just in a few years there, I'm not a doctor, so I wasn't there that long, but email became very normalized. So this has been a part of growing my life, right? This is part of who I am and how we've lived in a new world that we're all experiencing in all of these different ways. Um, at, at home, I have three kids and they are clamoring for more screen time every day. Uh, if I were to let it go wild, I don't think they would ever leave home. They might just eat cereal and live in front of a screen uh, for their whole life. I mean, that's how much they desire screens and watching that and the influence that it has on them. I did a little survey uh, the other day. I walked around my house to kind of count up the number of devices and screens that were in use. And we have five humans. Again, uh, Rachel and I, three kids. Our kids, none of them have phones. Um, but I found that we had 15 screens that were actively in use between phones, tablets, uh, Lexus with screens, uh, TVs, devices that had screens that were there. And that didn't even include the, the six Alexas that were around the house that don't have screens, the one in the drawer for vacation, the drawer full of old devices and tablets and phones that would hand me down throughout time or that we have gone through. Um, I hold a high regard for technology and what it can do and offer my life. Um, again, I've got 33 devices connected to my Wi-Fi even when I checked it, right? I am in the midst of this. And again, I love the efficiency that it helps with my life. I love the productivity that it develops and I love the connectivity that it offers. The fact that at any time I can get in touch with people throughout my life, be able to check in on them, to be able to see what's happening in their lives. It is a huge piece of my life. But if I'm honest, I'm also in the process of asking a lot of questions in the midst of this, especially as I'm watching my kids grow up in the midst of this. But the question I'm asking myself is, is this good for me? 
right? Um, is this good for my soul? The way I'm using these things, is this good for my kids? Is my technology or my device, my content, my media, is, is it bringing me closer to God? Is it bringing me closer to you? Is it bringing me closer to my friends and family that I love, right? I'm trying to take some time to ask these bigger questions. Um, the pace of our life has ratcheted up so fast. The, the actual violence of our schedules and the noise and the cacophony of our lives has become so loud, loud that it, it, it is often very difficult to slow down and ask these questions of our lives. But yet we've been doing that the last several weeks as part of this series. We've been talking about how our faith interacts with our stuff, uh, with our bodies, with our feelings and our emotions, with the ways that we actually live our everyday lives. How does our faith impact that? And today I want to slow down, which isn't one of my strong suits in speech or in life, to ask some of these bigger questions. How are we integrating our faith and our technology. Ultimately, are our screens and our devices and our social media and the algorithms that are running around us, are they getting us closer to the great commandment to love God and to love others? Or am I replacing God and pushing my faith to the margins and putting myself and my technology in the middle of my life? I wanna dive in today to some biblical wisdom that I think can help us navigate the culture that we live in. In the Old Testament, uh, we're going to be looking at someone named Daniel. You may be familiar with him, but he is part of the people of God, the people that God has set apart, uh, that he has loved, that he has used as a showcase to his love throughout time. And they're walking into a very difficult season. They've lost their homeland. They're being moved into exile into a place called Babylon. They've lost their home and their culture, and they're assimilating into this new culture that is very different for them. And ancient Babylon was a place and a culture, again, that was very different from what they had grown up in. It's full of every whim and desire that the pagan world could want. And it's a wild place that was devoid of morals and absent of the God they've known, yet also still interested in spirituality. I really like how David Kinnaman of the Barna Group defines ancient Babylon. He said that ancient Babylon was the pagan but spiritual, hyper-stimulated, multicultural, imperial crossroads that became the unwilling home of Judean exiles, including the prophet Daniel, who we're going to talk about today. And this was in the sixth century BCE. He goes on to talk about where we're living now. He says, but the digital Babylon is not a physical place. It is the pagan but spiritual, hyper-stimulated, multicultural, imperial crossroads that is the virtual home of every person with Wi-Fi, a data plan, and for most of us, both. So he makes a case that as the people of God had moved into ancient Babylon, we as a culture have moved into digital Babylon, this new space that has existed over these years where everything is available at all times. He continues on, he says, Christians whose understanding of the world is framed by the Bible can think about our experience as living in a shift from Jerusalem to digital Babylon. And these are two of the ways human society is depicted in the Bible and they endure today as helpful archetypes of civilization. Uh, you're going to find on your screen uh, a kind of a comparison of what Jerusalem was like moving into Babylon, which should look very similar to maybe how things have shifted over the last years for us as technology has paced and rapidly changed. In Jerusalem, it was mono-religious, but in Babylon, it was a pluralistic society. They went from a slower pace to an accelerated and frenetic pace of life. In Jerusalem, it was homogeneous, but in Babylon, it was very diverse. They went from central control to an open source environment, from sweet and simple to complex and bittersweet. The idols in their old country were religious pride and false piety, yet the new idols are fitting in and not missing out. Kenneman continues on, he says, the pages of scripture and the annals of human history suggest that there are times when faith is at the center and times when faith is pushed to the margins. In digital Babylon, where information and anything we could ever want or need is instantly available at the God-like swipe of a finger, Almighty God has been squeezed to the margins. Those of us who long to keep him at the center of our lives constantly fight the centrifugal force of a world spinning us away from him. This transition from faith at the center to faith at the margins is happening in North America and other societies in the cultural West. Doesn't this feel accurate when you hear that? Uh, you and I are living in digital Babylon. We have access to every piece of information that we could ever want, every piece of entertainment at the touch of our fingers, at the flash of an eye. 
and a lot of us are, are feeling unmoored at the change of the pace of our life and the ways things have changed in the midst of this. Things are happening so quickly, the rapid advance every day, every year, how much has changed and how quick it's happening. And we know that there is a place in a way that we were created for that doesn't always line up for the ways that we're living now. We're learning how to live in a new culture, in a new way, in so many different ways. And the truth is our screens, our technology, our devices, they are shaping us. Back um, when in Jesus' time, when he called his early disciples to follow him, he called them disciples, right? These were the people that he was taking to shape, to mold, to change over time. He was teaching them, informing them. Well, now our screens do that. When you think about that, they take up half of our waking hours. They are shaping and changing us. So we need to be aware and to be cognizant of that. And I would argue that technology itself is pretty neutral, right? The screens, the devices that we have, but what we do with it, the content we consume, the ways that we use, this gift that we've been given, because this is a gift. I mean, the things that we have now, the, the, the opportunities that we have to use what we have, it is an absolute gift. Yet the ways that we use it, uh, the ways that we consume with it is very much not neutral in the midst of that. Our social media, our broadcast media, it all has power and influence. And it has the power to bring us closer to God and each other in an unimaginable ways that didn't even exist just a few years ago. Yet it also has the opportunity to drive a wedge further between us and between God. So Babylon is very different and it's far away from where God's people thought they would be. And they're having to learn how to follow him in this new place, in this new context, in this new cultural way of living. Again, doesn't that sound familiar? So we're going to look at some of Daniel's story today. He's a devout follower of God and how he thrived in Babylon and how that might help us today. So we're going to begin in Daniel 1, verse 1. It says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles of the temple of God. So we see at the very beginning People are being moved. The land has been sieged. They're moving to Babylon. But Daniel, Daniel is writing this story for us. He's, he's capturing what's happened throughout his life to tell us the story of God. And where does he start as he looks back and tells his story? He highlights this. And the Lord delivered. From the very get-go of this story, the Lord was in charge. God was in charge. Daniel never forgot that. And he wanted his readers to know that God is still in charge. And we can get so lost in the weeds in the midst of any of these conversations where we have about where faith meets us in the ways that we live. But we have to remember that God is ultimately in charge. And Daniel reminds us of that. Not only does he remind us of that, he lives that truth every day. He remembered that God was in charge as he was navigating this new reality that he was living in. So what do we do with that? What, what do we do practically here in 2022 to live that out? Well, I believe it's a couple of things. It's, it's, we see Daniel regularly praying and slowing down throughout his time as he's trying to discern what to do. So I believe that's what we need to do as well. That the first thing we need to do is we need to slow down. We, we need to slow down. We need time away from our screens and our devices. Uh, we need to find some places to put them away, to find these places of quiet, solitude, these places where we can slow down and listen and hear, th to be reminded that we are not the center of the story, that there is more to life out there. For me, so often that's in nature of just seeing God's creation and being reminded that God is present in my life. There is something about slowing down and getting away and being reminded that there is a world going around, around us, that uh, there are people that God has given us to love, that there is beautiful creation that's there. And when we slow down and listen, we're reminded that there is a God who is in control and that there is more to life. One of my favorite stories of Jesus is in Mark, in, in the early part of his story. The disciples say he's gone and healed a bunch of people and the next day they're, they're out looking for him. They can't find him because there's so much work to be done and Jesus is in a quiet place and he's praying. He slowed down and Jesus is the God of the universe with skin on it. And if he needs to slow down, how much more do you and I need it? If, if Jesus needed to slow down to be with his father, absolutely it's something we need to be able to remember that he's there. And it releases us from some of the grip that our devices and our media, that just even the centrality of who we are in our lives is there. So we start with slowing down and then we need to pray. We need to pray. 
we need to slow down and we need to pray and ask God what to do. A question that I've been trying to ask, especially in the midst of preparing for this series that I hope is going to be continued into my days and weeks to come is asking God, what do you want me to do with my technology? Have you ever, have you ever asked that question? Right? We've been gifted with all of this amazing ability, the, the access that we have, the connectivity that we have, but have you ever asked God what he wants you to do with it? It's really humbled me to ask that question, to be in the midst of that, because there's some places where I found like, I'm not, I'm not using it the way he'd want me to. There, there are places where I'm spending too much time where it's disconnecting me from my family, from other people, and it's really challenged me as I've listened to him and finding those spaces to ask that. Paul, as he's writing to the early church, he says, everything's permissible, but not everything is beneficial. And there's part that, that comes up in that question. How does God want me to use what he's given me? What is, how does he want me to use this gift that he's entrusted us with? And prayer is a time for us to be proactive and not just reactive to what's coming at us, to take the time ahead of time to be able to ask so that we can walk through it and not just respond and react when things are coming at us to prepare us for the way. So like Daniel, we need to remember that God is in charge. And whether we feel overwhelmed by this or not, or whether we even think this is something we need to think about, we need to start there. So then Daniel faces one of his first big tests that we find in his story. Will he leave behind his beliefs and devotion to God and in favor of devotion to this new culture that he's entering into? You see, he's committed to following God. And one of the ways that he knows to follow him most faithfully is through his diet through the ways that he eats. It is an external way that shows that he is devoted to God. It's a way that he's been trained up and taught throughout time to be devoted to him. And it was one of the ways that he reflected his faithfulness. So we come to his story in Daniel 1.8. And it says, But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. You see, uh, they had brought these young men uh, to this new place, and they were testing them. They wanted them to, to eat well and to be able to perform well, they were raising up uh, people in part of this new land and they were calling them there and Daniel's part of it. So they want him to eat in a different way that would not be honoring the way he thought. Well, he continues on in verse nine. It says, now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, am I afraid of my Lord, the King, who has assigned your food and drink? Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The King would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the Official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his friends. Verse 12, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested him for 10 days. So Daniel lets them know, listen, I'm going to stay faithful to this. So are my friends, see what happens. Uh, put a test to this. I'm going to stay faithful to God, see what he does. Verse 15, it says, at the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service and every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom we see that Daniel remains true to his convictions. And when he did, when they looked at him, when they, when they put God to the test in the midst of this, they said that there were none that were stronger and better than Daniel in the midst of that. None were found equal. God, God rewarded his devotion and he thrived in the midst of this new culture. And like Daniel, we need to keep God in the center of our lives. In a culture where God so easily moves to the margins, uh, which is very much like ours. Or again, think about those statistics, the number of hours that we spend on screens, yet the number of hours that are there for God. We are, get pushed to the margins so many ways. We need to put God in the middle and rely on him uh, to lift up his name and our actions and the ways we speak and the ways that we live. And the world and the rulers around saw Daniel and his character and convictions and, and saw him relying on God. And it changed the world around them. It changed the ways they were moved up into this society. And we need to do the same with our technology and our medium. How we use it affects the world around us. It affects the people around us day to day and how we live this. I think practically what we learn when we see Daniel in the midst of this culture and as we are trying to apply this to our culture and landscape, we need to put up some boundaries around our technology and then stick to them too much like Daniel did. 
we need to ask some of these questions in the midst of how we use it. Uh, what are we willing to do and not do with our technology and our media? Um, how much time are we willing to give over to it? Uh, what are we putting into our lives and what is the output of that in the midst of our lives? Where are we willing to go and not go? And, and to what end? You see, Daniel, Daniel didn't stop eating. He didn't starve himself and cut himself off from the gifts that were there, but he did stick to a diet in the midst of that. He made some conscious decisions about the ways that he was going to live to honor his God. And Daniel knew to keep God in the middle, he was gonna to have to say no to some things and yes to some others. He set boundaries and he showed the world a God that was worth following. And again, I'm not saying that we need to stop using technology. Again, I think it's one of the greatest gifts that God has given us. It's an amazing tool, all of the different ways that we get to use it. But we might need to consider going on a digital diet as we consider the boundaries that are there. And when I think about that, I think about a story that years ago, our lead pastor, John Parker, had shared with me. He was counseling a young man who uh, was addicted to pornography. And as he talked to him, uh, it was at a time when our devices were not on us all the time. And he, uh, he was telling him that really the place we accessed, it was the computer that he had at home, but he just couldn't find a way to re get released from this grip. You know, he didn't, he didn't use it at work because it was inaccessible there. He didn't have his phone with him. It was just his computer at home. And John uh, counseled him and said, well, why, why won't you just get rid of the computer? Just cut that off as a way to not have access to it. And he just said you could just see the look on the guy's face. He's just like, I, I can't. And as he walked away, and I thought about the rich young ruler as he approached Jesus and said, what do I need to do to inherit heaven? When he said to give up his possessions, he just couldn't do it, right? There's times when we have to be willing to say no to things to give us life because some of those pieces are not leading us where we want them to go. Practically, uh, if you have children, parents, we, we need to help our kids. We have to help our kids navigate this landscape they're in. I, again, there is no limit to what they can consume. As I watch mine, just the desire, the things they, right? It is just nonstop what they would want. We, we have to help them. And sometimes it's gonna be helping them put the limits on it. Sometimes it's gonna be saying no to certain things or maybe doing it together. I have found it very interesting that in the world around us, just in culture in general, there's this movement called Wait Till Eight, where even just people that are outside of all that, people that are in the technology industry are encouraging people to wait till eighth grade to give their kids phones because they know the access that is there and what is available without any sort of restrictions or without any sort of help around it. Screens are especially discipling our kids. They're using it throughout the day in school so often the times and they have this desire to see it. But why do they have desire? Because they see us using it. Kids, we need your help. Uh, if you have parents or even if you're at an age where you've grown up with this and you're working with other adults who haven't, we need you. Parents, your kids help your parents. Um, most of your parents, most of the people that are around you that are older did not grow up with the access that you have. They don't know how to use these tools. We need help with our limits. Remind us to put our devices away when we're present with you. Remind us to put our away at, away at meals. One of the rules that we have in our house is that we don't have our devices at mealtime. We put them away. Then our kids have permission to call us out on it. And we fail at it so often because something comes up and we think about it and we need to check a calendar. And then all of a sudden we're in our email and our, our text and all these other things. And our kids have permission to even to make fun of us in the midst of that, to poke fun of us. When we're they're sitting there and trying to talk to us and we're so engrossed in the screen that they're, one, they're learning behaviors, but kids, we need you to remind us to be present with you. Those of you who have better digital etiquette, for those of us who don't help us with that, help us to be present because we do. We want to be with you, yet we get so consumed with what's right in front of us. We need help in this area to be better followers of Jesus, to be better lovers of you. Uh, when we set boundaries with our technology, and when we follow them, this, this is good news telling about our God to the world around us. This is a way that the world sees how we live different for him. But, but this costs. You see, boundaries always do. I know that there is digital currency and knowing what's going on in the world. There is, there is social capital baked into the system of knowing all the memes that are happening or not knowing right there. There is a cost to knowing and not knowing what's happening in our digital realms and all of it and what's trending and being on point on all of these different things. But Jesus told us that to follow him, that there actually would be a cost, or that there would be a cross to bear, that this is not actually an easy path, that the, the yoke is easy and the burden is light, yet the, the way is narrow in the midst of that. 
the cross for some of us in this particular stage of life that you find you're in might be finding ways to be on a digital diet of setting boundaries in your life so that you can be more present to the people that God has called you to be present there. Well, Daniel's story continues on. He goes to actually care about the place where he lives and humbly serves those who are far from God. So he sees him becoming a huge part of the culture he lives in. And he ultimately he's given a very high position. He's given this opportunity to rule a lot. In Daniel chapter six, we catch up with him again. He's under a new king now. And it says it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel, one of the highest rulers in the land. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. And at this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so because he lived so ethically and so faithfully committed to God, the boundary in his life. He remembered God that was at the center. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So they set a trap for him and they had everyone in the land pray to the king because they wanted to get rid of him because they knew if his because they wouldn't be able to live the way they wanted to under this. And so they set a trap and the order is given, the king gives his order and Daniel won't follow it because he remains faithful to his God, but the king loves him and he wants to protect him, but he has set an order. So Daniel famously is placed in the pit of lions. And as the night goes on, the lions are tamed. The king comes back the next morning and finds him safe. The angels are protected him. And in fact, if you get a chance, I would highly encourage you to read Daniel 6 because it's such an incredible story of what happens. But after the king sees the power of God, this is what he writes because of Daniel's faithfulness in all these areas of his life. Daniel 6, 26 to 28, the king writes this, I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel for he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian in ancient Babylon where God was absent. The king issued a decree to follow God because of Daniel's actions, because of the ways that he lived and it changed the world around them. Daniel continued to trust God with all of his life and he lived this life with character and humility and devotion and he was unwilling to remove God from the center of his life. And again, the rulers took notice and it changed. His influence changed the world around him. And he continued to flourish and prosper in this foreign land. The world, the, the people around you, uh, your neighbors, your family, your friends, the people that you run into every day where you live, work and play, they're looking and watching to see if your life is different. And they're looking at every aspect of our lives in every area. And if technology is, again, consuming about half of our waking hours, you better believe they're looking to see how we're navigating this as well, how we're posting, what we're doing, how we're using this in all the different aspects of our lives. What is gonna be written about you and your devotion of God to all of these areas of your life? Um, here at Summit, uh, we come back to the great commandment a lot. It's one of the, the core principles of how we want to live in the light of God's love as a church. In Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 to 40, it says, Teacher, which is the greatest command in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. We have to be willing to ask these questions about every part of our lives but specifically today about our technology and the ways that we use it. Is this helping me love God more fully and to love my neighbors more fully? And there are ways that this has transformed my life with God. Uh, the fact that I have a, a device sitting next to me on my nightstand every night and the first thing in the morning when I open up my Bible reading plan on there. I, I have never been as faithful to read the Bible since I've had a device that keeps track of it, that gives me a reading plan, that keeps me on pace with it. It's been transformative. 
the fact that we can put scriptures up in the midst of our sermons at the church, that we have access, that people have access on their device anytime, all the time to the word of God. Unbelievable, the transformation. That the fact that there's content like The Chosen that have helped me think differently about Jesus and, and see him in a new way and to be able to build my love for him. The, the, the ability to connect with you all, to with my friends and family, to be able to know what's happening, to be able to be in touch. It's unbelievable some of the things that we've had access to that draw me closer to God and to other people. But I think as part of that, we just have to ask the question, are we loving God and people more or are, are we replacing God with our technology? Are we moving him to the fringes in our screens and our content our media? Are they moving to the center? Or is the information that we have? I'm so guilty. I love information and knowing things. But is that taking the center and moving God to the side? I mean, I think back even to the very beginning in the creation story in Genesis uh, there's Adam and Eve are set up perfectly in the Garden of Eden, living with God in perfection. Yet what was there, what was sitting there that was the one thing they were supposed to avoid? It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. To know everything, to know more than God. And there was this moment where if, if, if they could just know more, then they could do their own thing, right? It's the same trap that we fall on today. And, but what happens if, the, if we know enough, maybe we don't need God anymore. Maybe we have enough TED Talks. Maybe we have enough of these other things and God can move to the margins because we figured it out on our own. The thing that can give us so much life can maybe slowly be killing us, much like Wolverine, right? The adamantium that's in there. It gives him all this power, but at the same time, slowly killing him. Is that what's happening in the midst of this? Is it pulling us apart? Is this bringing me closer to people? Is it actually bringing me closer to them? Right, I've got to ask these questions and I hope you will too because here's the thing, you and I, we were created in the image of God. One of the most beautiful things that you and I were created in his image when God was created and exists in relationship, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, from the beginning of time to the end, he lives and exists in relationship and he's created you and I for relationship. And we will seek out connection and relationship wherever we are built for, there's a hole in there for us. And that can either be to people and to God or are we building it on our screens and our devices in those places in ways that may not be healthiest for us, right? On the far end of the extremes, porn makes connections in the wrong ways and rewires our brains in terrible ways, right? There are ways that when we get connect with groups and, and, and audiences that are actually aren't helping us, that maybe are actually making us feel worse about ourselves. Yet there are also ways that we can use it for beauty and good that draw us closer to God and the people. Right? We have to ask the question, that does this connection, this connectivity, does it help us? Does it make it us more connected but love less? Right? Does it decrease our love, the ways that we're using our social, the ways that we think about people? We have to ask the questions. Some of you are navigating this beautifully, but for a lot of us, we're struggling. Right? Is it connection well spent? I'm going to conclude our time with this uh, writing from a Hasidic rabbi that wrote on his deathbed. He said this, when I was young, I set out to change the world. And when I grew a little older, I perceived that this was too ambitious, so I set out to change my state. This too, I realized as I grew older was too ambitious, so I set out to change my town. When I realized I could not even do this, I tried to change my family. Now as an old man, I know that I should have started by changing myself. If I had started with myself, maybe then I would have succeeded in changing my family, the town, or even the state, and who knows? maybe even the world. Daniel started with himself. He started with his reliance on God and it changed the world around you. This work, these questions, this aspect, this work starts with you and it can change the world. Jesus promises us that there is a renewing of ourselves, that there is a promise of new life with him and it can change us first and by that it can change our family and our lives and the people around us in the world. And I believe it all starts with slowing down and praying and asking the question, God, what do you want me to do with my technology? And then listening and responding. And I think we have to ask ourselves how our tech is affecting us and being willing to put up boundaries to keep God in the center of our lives. Maybe to put ourselves on a digital diet to be proactive in those areas. And I think with all of our media, social and otherwise, asking the question, um, is this helping me love God and my neighbor more fully? And if not, if it's distancing us from either of those, we have to be willing to respond and change. This is a lot to think about, but 
It's taking up a huge portion of our lives and it should have commensurate time and thought. If you already know that this is an area you need help, I would highly encourage you to check out Regroup. It is a safe community to be able to walk through. This is an incredible area to do that. But for all of us, if we're wired up and we're thinking about these things, talk to some people. A lot of us are having these same thoughts and questions and we're trying to figure out how to do this. Get together with people, invite people in. My hope and prayer is that through all of this, we would integrate this well and that we would be able to love God and love our neighbors more fully. Let's pray. Uh, God, thank you for these gifts. Thank you for these amazing gifts and opportunities you have given us to connect with you and to connect with others in unimaginable ways, things that weren't even possible just mere years ago. God, it is an amazing time to be alive. So thank you. Thank you for entrusting us with this. Thank you for all these different ways that you have wired us up uh, to be in relationship, Lord. But I pray that as we think about how to navigate our technology, how we look at how to integrate this well in our lives, Lord, that you would help us to slow down and pray and ask these big questions in our lives. How do you want us to use it? To keep you at the center of all of it, to be willing to put up boundaries, to go on digital diets, to be able to see and ask the questions if we are loving you more and our neighbors more and where we are, we should celebrate and keep doing that and do that in more and more ways in the areas where we're not, where we're finding us drifting farther away, where our faith is moving to the margins and other things are moving into the center. Lord, that we'd be willing to take those steps to move them. God, this is hard work, yet it's work done with you. It's beautiful and good and good for the world around us and good for our souls as well. So be with us, Lord, as we navigate this well, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God is my shepherd I won't be wanting I won't be wanting He makes me red In fields of green With quiet streams Even though I walk through the valley of death and dying, I will not fear, cause you are with me, you are with me. Shepherd's staff comforts me. You are my feet in the presence of enemies. Surely goodness will follow me. Will follow me in the house of God. Wow. 
We're so glad that you all have decided to join us today, but we want to remind you that this online service experience does not replace in-person gatherings with other believers. So if you're here in the Orlando area, we would encourage you to come check out one of our in-person locations. But if you're not, we would really hope that you get plugged in with a local church community wherever you are. But that's all we have for you guys today. We're so glad that you decided to join us. We hope you have a great week and we'll see you next time.